everyone. I hope you've all had a good weekend. Next up, we're going to be looking at the crisis of the Eastern Bloc. So what is the Eastern Bloc? So the Eastern Bloc is a group of Eastern European countries that were aligned militarily, politically, economically, and culturally with the Soviet Union approximately approximately from 1945 to 1919. Members included Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was effectively expelled in 1948, and Albania withdrew in 1961. The remaining Eastern Bloc countries constituted a sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, which maintained high oversight and varying degrees of direct and indirect control over Bloc members until the revolutionary uprisings of 1989. So during the years of the Eastern Bloc's existence, its member countries traded primarily with the Soviet Union, aligned their military and foreign policies with those of the Soviet Union, receiving large quantities of humanitarian and economic aid from the Soviet Union. It maintained a one-party socialist governmental systems modeled on that of the Soviet Union and were ruled by communist elites who had been sanctioned by the Soviet Union. The Warsaw Pact and Eastern European during the Cold War. So the Soviet Union dominated Central and Eastern Europe during the Cold War. After World War II, it formed the Warsaw Pact, a military alliance of European communist states meant to counter NATO. So the alliance included six European countries occupied by the USSR following Nazi defeat plus Albania and is, is also referred to as the Eastern Bloc. Although it was presumably a military alliance, the Warsaw Pact was used as an instrument to keep communist regimes in power in those countries. It was dissolved after the communist regime collapsed at the end of the Cold War. So Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968, they tried to withdraw and the revolts were crushed. So new regimes in Central and Eastern Europe. By the final weeks of the Second World War, Soviet troops had advanced westward, pushing the Nazi army back to Berlin. When the war ended, Soviet, Soviet troops occupied several Central and Eastern European states, including the Eastern part of Germany. So during the war, the USSR absorbed the three formerly independent Baltic states, Estonia, Latv Latvia, and Luthania, as well as a piece of Romania, which is established as the Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic. In the remaining Central and Eastern European states, it occupied the USSR, the USSR helped establish hardline communist governments modeled after the Soviet system. The USSR, along with the United States, Britain, and France, jointly occupied Germany and Austria. The victorious powers established Austria as an independent and neutral country, but disagreed over the fate of Germany. The three Western powers established the market-based Federal Republic of Germany in the West, 
while the USSR established the hardline socialist state of the German Democratic Republic in the East. Escalating tensions and fear of further communist expansion prompted the formation of NATO in response out of anger that the Western allies had allowed rearmament in West Germany, the USSR formed the Warsaw Pact, which is named after the city where the treaty was signed. The government of the Warsaw Pact carried out repressive policies throughout their existence, including severely limiting freedom of speech, preventing opposition parties from gaining power, and establishing extensive networks of spies to monitor citizens and arrest those suspected of opposing the regime. The states of the Warsaw Pact generally enjoyed higher living standards than the Soviet Union, but lagged far behind Western Europe. So now crisis in the Soviet bloc. So when crisis arose in the Soviet bloc in 1953, 56, 1968, and 1980, 1981, Soviet leaders feared the developments in one or more East European countries, it would spill over into the other East Bloc countries, including the Soviet Union itself. New evidence from the East European and former Soviet archives shows that social ferment did indeed spread surprisingly quickly from one East Bloc country to the other countries. Come to think of it, in 1956, for example, unrest in Poland helped precipitate a violent rebellion in Hungary, and the revolution in, in Hungary in turn sparked disturbances in Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Soviet Union, as well as the students' protests in Belarus and the Russian Republic. And then in 1968, the Prague Spring of Czechoslovakia stirred unrest in numerous Soviet republics, especially neighboring Ukraine, and it also inspired students in Poland during their riots that year against the regime of, what's the name, well, can't say the name, but it's Walaitso Gomuka. Okay, and then in 1980 and 81, the rise of solidarity in Poland, which is a trade union, generated ferment in several East European countries and most of the Western Soviet republics. Um, so there's no longer any doubt that concern about the political spillover from East European crisis was one of the main factors shaping Moscow's policy in the region from the late 1940s through to the mid-1980s. So the collapse of the East European communism in 1989, as the Orthodox Soviet-style regimes fell in rapid succession, vividly showed that Soviet leaders earlier, it showed the um, earlier Soviet leaders' concerns about a spillover in Eastern Europe those um, concerns were well-founded. So causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union, some of the causes, um, massive spending, the Soviets spent tons and tons of money fighting to support the communist cause and put down revolts in places like Hungary, Afghanistan, Enormous amounts of money were spent on the arms and space race as the USSR worked to outdo the USA in both areas. Then with the economic recession beginning in 1986, the Soviet Union began significantly cutting funding to its satellite states. This move is usually discussed as the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, which is experiencing a recession similar to the Great Depression in the United States, in the, which was in the 1930s. 
Um, and then what was the USSR like in 1985? So in 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became leader of the USSR, at the time, the USSR had many problems. So the economy was collapsing. The USSR was spending more money than it could afford on the Cold War arms race. There were tensions with the West. The USSR was losing the war in Afghanistan. The people of the USSR were angry about their poor standards of living and long queues for basic goods. They did not think that their government could solve their problems. So now we're going to look at the Soviet Union in between 1985 and 1990. So this is an ex excerpt from an interview. So here in front of you, this is Tatiana Maskilerson, who grew up in both the Soviet Union and in Russia. <laughs> Excuse me. So she says, my childhood was happy. All children are happy. My mother was a nurse and my father was a contractor. They also farmed potatoes and other vegetables. Everything we ate was grown on our farm. They sold milk from our cow in town. There were always shortages. We never had enough basic foods, clothes, or hygiene products. We were given government-issued ration tickets to purchase the items we needed, which were not always available, even with the tickets. Goods that were high in demand, generally things that were not manufactured in the USSR were things that we had to stand in lines for. Before the fall of communism, the lines were not as bad, but after they were, but after they were long. You would start at 2 or 3 a.m. to get what you needed by morning. If you had a bigger family, you would put each member in every item line you needed. My parents did not belong to the party, but they were not opposed to it either. If you opposed communism, you would be put in jail. In order to be a true member of the party, you had to reach a certain level in school. Your teachers would rate you. Before it fell, I reached the second level, pioneer. As a child, you felt so proud of yourself. What it was eventually preparing you for was to be an active member of the Communist Party. All criticism was shut down by the KGB before it even occurred. They had such a widespread spy system, but yes, there were probably people who went against the Soviet Union, but they were silenced by the police and the KGB before anything was published. The media only portrayed good things. Television was controlled 100% by the government. I never even knew that there were such things as offenses against the party. It was never reported or talked about. We knew nothing about the rest of the world before communism fell. But the news reported a lot of how good Gorbachev's plans were working like Perestroka and Glasnost. They said how effective they were but they actually hurt the economy and didn't give us any form of free speech. My most traumatic memory of the whole experience was the coup that happened the summer before. The coup made it real to me that our country was in trouble. After that, everything just kept happening and surprised no one. When the initial shock passed, people changed how they felt about communism. No one believed it anymore. It made people lose faith in the whole system their only belief system. It was terrifying because before you thought that your life was all planned out, you thought that every, everything would be provided for you and all you had to do was work for it and believe in it. Then it all collapsed. Our town was doing pretty good. After communism fell, it is when it got bad. Our town had industry and factories. They were making bullets and other equipment I don't know what they made exactly, but it wasn't disclosed. During, we didn't always have enough food, but we had jobs and places to live. Nobody had everything, but basic things people had. But during all of this, I was a child, so I didn't notice anything major. 
It wasn't Christmas because there was no it wasn't there wasn't Christmas because there was no religion. It was a normal school day. Nothing got cancelled. I don't remember much, but I was shocked and nervous. Since the coup, everyone kind of expected this to happen, but there was still a shock. The entire town was scared. People were afraid of change. My town was far from Moscow, but we were experiencing it secondhand, watching it on TV and hearing about it on the radio. Everyone tried to keep life going as normal, as best as they could. But the people stopped getting paid. It was all a gradual process. Our economy went back to the bargaining system. My family was okay, though, because of our farm. After it all collapsed, the ratings in schools stopped. So I didn't see a point in all the hard work. School determined what you were qualified to do. If you weren't getting closer to being a member of the party, what were you doing it for? What was, the, what was to encourage us to keep working and doing the right thing? That was what communism did, and we didn't know what to do without it. After factories had all closed, people had no jobs by 1992. Although it fell, my town seemed to be still run under communistic ideals. I left before I could witness the real change. The main reason for leaving for me was that communism fell. I had no future anymore. That's when we really noticed the change from communism. Everything was left to uncertainty. After it fell, crime went up. There was no more economic stability and we started to get real information. We got information on the news and the movies from other countries. The problem with the movies was that they weren't rated. So children like me were watching R-rated movies. As a child, this was a rush of information and exposure was very exciting, but also very overwhelming. Basically, the difference between living in the USSR and Russia was that before all, <clears throat> all we had was communism, and it was the only way of life. After there was such an insane amount of information and culture we were getting that we were getting that it was almost incomprehensible how we lived so long in the dark. Next up, we're going to look at Glasnost and Perestroika. So the Soviet Union struggled economically through the 1980s. The Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev introduced two bold concepts called Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost, Glasnost, Russian for publicity or openness, was a call for greater transparency in the Soviet government allowing more freedom of speech and freedom of press. In 1989, free elections and opposition parties were allowed, also for the first time in the USSR history. So now what we see is that journalists were allowed for the first time since the mid-1920s to reveal what life was really like in the USSR. Reports appeared on widespread corruption the hold of the mafia, the scale of poverty and prostitution, the deterioration of the health services, um, appalling pollution, immense ecological problems, and by the summer of 1988, on the enormous privileges of the top bureaucrats. So this openness spread from the media to cultural life. Banned novels began to appear in print, in print and banned paintings to replace the mon monstrosities of the socialist um, of socialist realism in the art galleries. So now, rock groups um, whose songs expressed and were ex whose songs expressed um, undirected but bitter anger at the system were invited by sections of the official youth organization that was called the Komsomol to appear at concerts. Um, econom economists cut through 60 years of lies about economic performance and historians began to reveal slowly at first truth about Stalin's period. Um, a film about Moscow's trials that were banned in January 1988 received a widely publicized television showing um, four months later 
by the end of the year of the year every one of the party members liquidated by stalin in the 1930s had been rehabilitated so in the course of 1989 there were even few articles praising trotsky's historical role so it was as if the ideology we see that um it was as if the ideology which had been attempted to strangle people's minds for six decades had collapsed overnight. And then going back to perestroika, which means restructuring, a Russian for restructuring, was a movement to reform the Soviet Union and allow for private ownership of some businesses. Within a few years, many of the countries under Soviet control broke away or underwent revolutions. So now when we look this, what, what did this mean? This meant improving the way the economy worked instead of the state trying to control everything. Um, so he let state enterprises make their own decisions and buy and sell at a profit, which was more like capitalism. Foreign investment was encouraged. So Gorbachev believed in communism, but he decided it needed to be reformed. So he introduced some changes. He introduced a series of reforms, right? So the downside of this was that the economy was in, in already in such a bad state that it collapsed without the state um, to control it. So Perestroika moved, but people believe that it moved too slowly. Life became harder for ordinary people. So there was higher prices and low production. So now because of glass north, people could speak out, right? Gorbachev lost support. There were those who blamed him for changing the communist system and those who thought his reform did not go far enough. His attempts to reform the communist party were seen as failed. So now, When we look at the crisis in the economy, it was not only among the radical intellectuals that discontent grew with Gorbachev. There was a growing mood of disillusionment among the mass of the people. This was already clear in the spring of 1989 elections when Yeltsin thrashed the official party nominee in, in Moscow and party candidates were defeated in cities like Leningrad and Kyiv. So the decisive factor was undoubtedly, undoubtedly that the economic situation, instead of improving with Perestroika, seemed to most people to be getting worse. Gorbachev's advisor, Abel, um, said early in 1989, this is a quote from him, the majority of Soviet families appear not to have a sense a change for the better. The supply of goods to the consumer market suddenly began to deteriorate sharply and noticeably before our eyes in the second half of 1987 and especially in 1988. So now homegrown insurgency. So a massive homegrown insurgency led by a number of different participants contributed to the collapse. So it was the workers, the intellectuals, advocates of national self-determination, which are the satellite and Baltic states. Okay, and reformers such as Gorbachev. Gorbachev. However, a historian called Harman argues differently. He says Gorbachev was neither a liberal nor a bold um, reformist. So it is usual to date beginnings of the change in the USSR with Gorbachev's accession to power early in 1985. Gorbachev himself did not have any particular reputation as a reformer. As exiled Russian dissident Zorez Medvedev put it, Gorbachev, he says he was neither a liberal nor a bold reformist. He owned his rise to the top, in fact, 
to sponsorship by the previous general secretary, but one, Andropov. He was a longtime head of the KGB and directly implicated in suppression of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. So now the USSR people, they are seething. The informal groups and anti-Soviet organizations like the Democratic Union were winning increasing support among young people. A wave of strikes was sweeping the country's coal mines from Vorkuta and Kuzbaz in Siberia to the Donbass in the Ukraine thousands of miles away. The strikes were only finally ended when Ryzkov, the prime minister, met with the strike committees in Moscow and agreed to concede their immediate economic demands. So in the aftermath of the strikes, Gorbachev pushed an anti-strike law through the Supreme Soviet, arguing we have already started to lose control of the economy. So now when we look at the economy, the situation in the economy and particularly in the third quarter has taken a sharp turn for the worst. So in September, in September, there was a serious drop in economic activity and in a desperate attempt to try to regain control of the situation, the situation, Ryskov announced a series of emergency measures to the Congress of Deputies in December. Measures which effectively abandoned, abandoned the move away from a centralized command economy, which was supposed to be the center of Perestroika. So the people, um, there was already the fifth, so this was, there was already uh, the, an, a fifth attempt to reform the country's economy in three decades. The reforms of 1956, 1966, 1979, 1983, the fifth attempt was getting nowhere. So you have an economic crisis, right, that is worsening and there is mass discontent. And then now we're going to look at the eruption of nationalism. So now, through most of 1988 and 1989, direct expression, expressions of class struggle were overshadowed by an eruption of nationalism amongst the non-Russian ethnic groups, which make up half the USSR's population. So in February 1988, the capital of Armenia, Yerevan, was suddenly swept by the biggest demonstrations seen anywhere in the USSR since 1927. They were over the demand of the population of a nearby region of the Azerbaijan Republic, Nagorno-Karabakh, to be united with the Armenian Republic. So few people outside the region had ever heard of this place called Karabakh, which was a poor mountainous re region of about 180,000 people. It had, for instance, only been mentioned once in the New York Times in half a century, but it was to cast its shadows over national politics for like the next two years. So the first demonstrators carried pictures of Gorbachev and chanted slogans such as Karabakh is the test of perestroika. Gorbachev spoke for an hour and a half on Armenian television, Poly Politiburo, Members rushed to Ar Armenia and Azerbaijan from Moscow, and 29 plane loads of troops were flown in and deployed in Yerevan. Um, but the demonstrators, the demonstrations continued for several days until Gorbachev agreed to an unprecedented negotiations with the representatives elected at a huge mass meeting. So, meanwhile, there was a sudden an unexplained outbreak of communal rioting in the Azerbaijan industrial port of Samgate on the Caspian Sea near Baku. Azeri crowds 
They set out on what was in effect a massacre of Armenian inhabitants and they killed 31 people. So the reaction of the authorities in Moscow was to arrest a few of the Azeri rioters and bring them to trial, but also to pour troops into both Armenia and Karabakh and to arrest leaders of the committees, which had led the national agitation there. So an article alleged that the demonstration had been taken over by political careerists and adventurers, among them those who proposed turning Armenia into a non-party republic. So now we see that uh, there's a pattern that was set which was to be repeated again and again. In March, there were demonstrations and general strikes in Armenia and Karabakh. In July, there were further strikes after troops shot a picket, a picket at Yerevan airport dead. So according to inhabitants, Soviet troops were out on the streets on Saturday with helicopters circulating over the city. Overnight, heavy troop reinforcement were reported to have been flown in. And then now in September, so still the, we, see, we, we still see there are more strikes, both the Karabakh and the Armenia, despite the fact that the main towns were under military occupation, the Armenians began to arm themselves and talk disapprovingly of Russian army helicopters, and they called them Swallows of Perestroka. They, they were the first communal conflicts between, there was the first communal conflicts um, between the Armenians and Azeris in the Karabakh and the neighboring Azerbaijan areas of Agdam. And the Armenians began to flee Azeri areas and Azeris Armenian areas. So now by the end of November, there were more than 100,000 refugees on both sides and general strikes and demonstrations in the Azerbaijani capital, Baku, as well as the Armenian cap capital, Yerevan. So tanks were patrolling the streets of both cities. And then eventually, in about 1989, Gorbachev imposed direct rule from Moscow on the Karabakh as a way of avoiding having to come down on the side of either Armenia or the Azerbaijan. Um, but it solved none of the problems. In the summer and autumn, a new unofficial mass um, Azeri organization and the Azerbaijan Popular Front succeeded in organizing strikes which stopped rail transport at the Armenian borders. Gorbachev, um, nor did Gorbachev return to the Karabakh, nor did Gorbachev's return of the Karabakh to Azerbaijani rule solve any problems either. So now by January 1990, there was near civil war on the borders as unofficial organizations on both sides got hold of weapons and a renewed slaughter of Armenians in Baku. So what Gorbachev sought out to do, he was out to stop attempts to declare the Republic independent of the USSR and to take down border posts which separated Soviet Azerbaijan from Iranian Azerbaijan. So you, the image you see is a demonstration in Yerevan on March 8, 1988 in honor of the victims of the ethnic massacres against Armenians in Samgate Azerbaijan in February 1988. So the conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan were only the first of many national movements to cause Gorbachev problems. The summer of 1988 saw the sudden emergence of movements in the three Baltic republics annexed by Stalin after the Stalin-Hitler Pact of 1939. Um, a series of huge demonstrations arose as people found themselves able for the first time to discuss openly the enforced incorporation 
of their previously independent states into the USSR and the subsequent deportation of tens of thousands of people to Siberia. So now they formed movements for restructuring, soon to be known as Popular Fronts, whose rallies attracted thousands of people onto the streets of every major city in the area. So now what we see is, at, at first, Gorbachev believed he could easily contain these movements, and he replaced the existing party leaders in these republics by his own nominee, nominees. And usually, um, local nationals who had made successful careers in all union apparatus, and he urged them to take place themselves, and he urged them to take place at the front of the movement for national identity and change. So in October 1988, the new Communist Party leadership appeared at the founding congresses of the Popular Front in each of the republics and read out statements of support for their aims endorsed by Gorbachev himself. So Gorbachev was unable to grasp the dynamic behind the nationalist movements. The sense of grievances of the indigenous Luthanians, Estonians and Latvians was so great that the Popular Front underwent a radicalization with which it was difficult for the local party leaders to keep up. So their attempts to do to um, force them to concede virtually um, complete libid, um, so by the early 19, by early 1988 the local radio stations were broadcasting open criticism of Soviet rule and the organizations still half banned an organization was still half banned everywhere else in the USSR, like the Democratic Union and the Belarusian Bilo Popular Front. They were able to meet openly in the Baltic republics now. So the local communist parties still found themselves losing support to the Popular Front, which took most of the local seats in the Congress of Deputies elections of March 1989. So now party members sent into the Popular Front with the aims of trying to make them, um, to, in trying to take them over. Those guys now ended up ignoring the party directors they had been given and regarding themselves first and foremost as front um, members. So now what we see by the end of 1989, the Popular Front in the three republics were openly committed to full independence from the USSR and they were compelling the local communist party leaderships to move in the same direction. What is more, the leg legitimization of the Baltic movements was a spur to feeling elsewhere in the USSR. So dissidents felt safe to raise demands which not long before would have been would have earned them prison time basically prison sentences while officials of the local republic believed that the correct tactics was to tag along with such demands so as to maintain popular support so national movements comparable in strength with those in the baltic states were soon firmly entrenched in georgia and moldavia as well as armenia and Azerbaijan by the middle of 1989. And nationalist agitation was receiving a strong echo in Belarusia and the Western Ukraine, even if its influence was not sweeping all before it. So meanwhile, scores of other national movements were emerging among Uzbeks, Tajiks, Kazakhs, Mesketians, Turks, Abbasians, and other, and many other groups. So now, these movements showed two sorts of dy dynamics. The first, the first, most threatening to the central bureaucracy in Moscow, over which Gorbachev presided, was towards um, succession. 
The second was towards bitter intercommunal conflicts, um, which they have, which they had with each other. So we can see a wave of strikes that um, engulfing the economy. We can see national minor minorities were expressing their grievances from one end of the USSR to the other. There were strikes in Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, Georgia, and Lithuania was demanding its in independence. So. So there was just no peace. And in Armenia and Azerbaijan, there was civil war. So everywhere there was um, a growing shortage of most of most of people of the most essential goods that people needed, and there was just growing discontent. And in Russian cities, um, the city of Volgograd, formerly which was known as Stalin Stalingrad. Um, and other places like Cherinogo, Toyman, a very important petrochemical center. Popular protests forced the local party party committees to actually resign. So demonstrations. Um, so demonstrations in by thousands in places like um, Kras. Krasnoda and Stavropol forced the army to cancel its call up of its call up of reserve res, 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 to go to Kaskas. So now the Ukrainian party leader we see in front of us, Ivashko, warned the general mood and political situation in the Ukraine could not, could not but be affected by events in Lithuania, Tra Transcaucasia, and Eastern Europe. People are stirred. Many many factories are making them many factors are making them uneasy. There are other people, um, like the head of the official state-run unions, who also warned that popular discontent was rising, and it may lead um, to mass labor conflicts. Um, a former Warsaw correspondent on a, on the paper on a paper wrote i am i feel like i am watching a repeat of a film 9 years later the miners of kuzbas and donbas would demonstrate there were many unfortunate similarities between the gdans the, the dance and shipbuilders protests and that of our miners and then we're going to continue to unpack this lecture in part two. We are going to look at Poland and um, Hungary in part two of this lecture.